is uh, about cleaning up magical crypto fairy dust with uh, some tools that I've created over the past half a year to a year called Cryptanalib and Feather Duster. Um, so if you don't know what magical crypto fairy dust is, it's, um, well, there's an old joke that uh, some, there's a, a developer who has a problem to solve and he uses a regex to solve it and now he has two problems. Um, that's kind of like trying to use crypto to solve problems. If you don't already know that crypto is the way to solve your problem, it's probably not. Um, so sort of uh, bad hand-waving crypto on stuff is referred to in some circles as magical crypto fairy dust. Um, and if you know me, that's like a term that I would absolutely love and do. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna talk about a number of things. Uh, we're gonna start out talking about how real world crypto is really broken. Um, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Um, and uh, nobody wants to get into crypto because they think it's too scary. Um, I'm going to talk to you about how it's really not that scary. It's not that hard to break crypto, and you might not believe me, but by the end of this talk, you will understand how to do some crypto attacks that you might not think you were capable of. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the tools themselves, Cryptanalib and Feather Duster, and a little bit about how they work, what their capabilities are, and how badass they are. Um, I'm a little biased, of course, because I made them and I spent a lot of time on them, but really, I think they're fucking badass. So, um, so let's start out with a little bit of basic terminology. Um, without understanding these couple of terms that I'm going to use a lot, you might be a little bit lost. They're a little bit self-evident, but just so we're all clear, ciphertext is some data that's in an encrypted form. Plain text is data in an unencrypted form. And cryptanalysis is a term that means, well, breaking crypto, basically. So most of the time, people think that it takes an insane amount of ability, talent, and study to break crypto. And that's actually, um, you know, I used to think that myself, that without having uh, a math degree, I was not going to be able to do anything useful in, in the field of cryptography or cryptanalysis. Um, and, you know, there's so many papers coming out constantly, like, how do you keep up with it? Well, um, as it turns out, it doesn't actually take that much. So um, random twiddling, in a lot of cases, is enough to break crypto. Um, just by doing certain things, you can actually have useful exploits against some crypto system. Uh, and, and, and it's just, you know, you didn't, you didn't even know what you were doing. You didn't even know how it worked. You just tried these weird things, and it just kind of works, right? So if you just, like, change parts of the encrypted data, uh, randomly, you might get a win. And that sounds like no, there's no way that's possible, but absolutely. Um, cutting and pasting things from one place to another. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Let's, let's get into that. But first, you, might, you still might not believe me, right? So I have some rhetorical questions, which might get you feeling a little bit more comfortable with the idea that, yes, you too can break crypto. So um, just to, I've got like some lights in my eyes, but um, just a show of hands, can, can you... Who, who knows what a hash algorithm is? Okay, so pretty much everybody. Um, can you tell, can, uh, again, show of hands, can anybody like tell me how MD5 works or SHA-1 or, or an, really any hashing algorithm? Yeah, kind of what I expected. Um, so, but you can probably write a hash cracker, right? Can I get a show of hands of people who have already written a basic hash cracker in any language? Okay, so maybe about a uh, third or a fourth of the people in the audience, roughly. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but enough people that, yeah, <laughs> you, you can do it, right? Um, or can you generate a basic rainbow table? Absolutely. So maybe you can't implement, uh, you know, these functions, but you can, do, you can launch these attacks. So this is kind of the case with a lot of crypto attacks. There's a lot of crypto attacks where you need to understand what the things are, what they're used for, what the important properties are, but you don't necessarily need to understand how to implement them, how they work in detail. So here's a list of common, trivially exploited crypto bugs that you find a lot. Um, those who have uh, been to AHA a bunch have probably seen me talk about some or probably all of these um, in various states of intoxication. <laughs> um, so let's, let's dive in. So about the simplest one to understand is the concept of decryption and encryption oracles. So these are systems that encrypt or decrypt data for you. And you would think that this doesn't happen ever, right? This just sounds like too stupid a mistake for somebody to actually make. 
but it happens an, an insane amount. You'd be, you'd be really surprised. So this is often discussed in uh, crypto literature um, as a means to attack an algorithm. It's kind of like, okay, if you're provided with this thing, can you break the algorithm? Can you retrieve the key? Can you, you know, do this, that thing that you shouldn't be able to do? Um, and that's sort of like the, the gold standard for an algorithm is having an attacker that has that kind of power, you know, the ability to decrypt whatever they want without actually being handed the key. Um, just a system that tells them the answer. And then, you know, uh, you ask it a bunch of questions, say, here's a ciphertext, here's a ciphertext, here's a ciphertext, get all those decryptions. And then you get a ciphertext that the oracle won't answer. Can you decrypt that? If no, then you have a, an algorithm which is uh, what's called end CCA secure. Um, so, you know, don't worry about these terms too much. This is not too important to understanding encryption or decryption oracles. It's just um, these are not well discussed because generally it's like a means to an end. It's never like if you decrypt random shit for people, that's bad, right? <laughs> But sometimes you can't avoid doing that in, where in, 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 in your system where you're, you're, you're working with crypto. Um, but in some cases, it's absolutely avoidable. So one uh, really common place where I've seen this um, is verbose errors. So if you take a, a piece of encrypted data that's fed into a SQL statement, uh, into like concatenated into a SQL query, and then run against a database, and no filtering is done after decryption, you can fiddle around with the bits and at some point, you're going to come across a, uh, just statistically speaking, you flip it enough times, one in 256 chance that you're gonna get a single quote and it's gonna break the query. And let's say that there's verbose errors that spit out like, hey, here's the query you tried to run, that's not gonna work, it's syntactically incorrect. So all of a sudden, here's this decryption oracle. And as long as you have uh, a single quote unmatched in that, that um, that encrypted data, or you can produce one by randomly flipping data around, it will actually decrypt it for you and give it to you. So I don't want to get too much into these examples, but this happens a lot more than you would think. So moving on from that, um, there's, uh, there's um, basically in modern crypto, there's two basic ciphers when you're talking about symmetric crypto, which is like you use the same key for encryption and, de and decryption. You have stream ciphers, and block ciphers. So stream ciphers effectively are the one-time pad but adapted for actual practical use. So the one-time pad is basically you have a message that's uh, n bytes long and you generate a bunch of truly random data that is also the same length as the message, n bytes long, and you XOR the two together and that's your ciphertext. And so you pass these random digits to somebody else and they can do the same in uh, operation and it actually reverses the process and gives you back your text. And this is actually, uh, you can mathematically prove that uh, ciphertext only attacks against this are impossible. You can learn absolutely nothing and you, you, you can mathematically prove that you can absolutely learn nothing from just the ciphertext. The problem is if you have a message that's n bytes long and you want to transmit a key that's n bytes long, you need to find a secure channel for transmitting n bytes that you can rely on so people can't get the key and decrypt your message. So if you can already send a secure secret of that length, why not just send the message over that channel and be done with it, right? So basically the extension on the one-time pad that is used to make stream ciphers is a cryptographically secure pseudorandom number generator. So stream ciphers in general are just a pseudorandom number generator and XOR. It, eff it effectively boils down to XOR. So um, this means that uh, the encryption operation and the decryption operation are both just XOR with the key stream generated by the random number generator. So you take a small value and you send that over a, a, a trusted channel and then you feed that to your uh, pseudorandom number generator which generates a huge stream of bytes that you can use to encrypt. Um, for a lot of stream ciphers we're talking like terabytes, petabytes, exabytes before you have to rotate your, before the, the, uh, the pseudorandom number generator becomes unsuitable for further use. So that's pretty cool. Um, so XOR, so stream ciphers are built on XOR, so how does XOR work? 
Well, um, basically think of it like um, either but not both. So it operates on uh, bits or Boolean values. So 0, x, or 1, that's w either but not both. Yep, absolutely matches that. So that's a 1. Um, another useful way to think about how XOR works is you take a starting value, and then you provide, uh, a, a, at least in when we're talking binary, um, and you provide a, a, another value to XOR it with, and anywhere there's a 1, you change that bit to the opposite. So I've uh, sort of boxed out the two places where there's a 1 in the uh, second operand to the, or, uh, to the XOR operation there. And you can see that the bits change in the resulting value. So it's, it's useful to think about XOR in that way for some of the time uh, when we're talking about these attacks. So another quick note, um, A XOR with A, or where for any A is always 0. So if you take any value and XOR it against itself, you get 0. Um, and if you think about like any bit, bits that are 1 get flipped, that means any bits that are 1 get changed to the opposite value, which means 0. So it's all zeros, right? Makes sense. Anything XORed with 0, again, think about the flipping. There's no zeros in the, 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 the second value, so it doesn't, like, nothing flips. It's the same thing. So that's the identity. Anything XORed with 0 is itself. And finally, um, there's the associative property of XOR, which basically means I can move parens around and it doesn't actually change the result of the operations. So I can do the XOR operations. If I just have a bunch of them, I can do them in any order and it will all turn out to the same thing. Kind of like how with addition, if you, you know, have parens on just random shit, it doesn't matter because you're all adding it into a big pile anyway. So, um, one thing that a lot of people don't think you can do is modify encrypted data in a meaningful way. And as it turns out, you absolutely can. You absolutely, absolutely can, and without knowing the key. Um, so there's this property called malleability, which is uh, sort of the idea of how, how directly do the changes you make to uh, encrypted data reflect in the plain text data. So um, as it turns out, Stream ciphers are extraordinarily malleable. So um, I've got a little picture here which is clearly, you know, uh, plain text values, but it works the same way with ciphertext. So if I flip just random bits in the encrypted value that represents admin equals zero, eventually, if I just flip single bits, I will end up with admin equals one instead because that's just a single bit flip away. So if you have an encrypted cookie, a stream cipher encrypted cookie, and it's not integrity checked, I can just flip those bits, flip those bits, flip those bits, and suddenly I'm an admin, so, which, is, which is nuts, right? You know, like, and I've actually run into a situation kind of like this, uh, where just flipping shit randomly resulted in, in, in horizontal privilege escalation. Horizontal privilege escalation. Wow. Um, so, and this, this applies to any ZOR-based encryption. Um, the only uh, encryption that basically comes down to XOR for the entire thing that's actually worth anything is, is the set of ciphers and stream ciphers, right? Um, anything where you're just talking XOR and there's not any, like, pseudorandom number generator involved is it's not good. But anyway, so let's move on. So let's, let's show that this is actually the case, where flipping a bit in the cipher text means the corresponding bit in the plain text flips. So um, we can say that there's this, uh, that we can call the cipher text of some message C, and you get that by XORing the message, which we'll call M, with the key stream, or the, the result of the random number generator based on the, the key that was used as the seed, as K, right? So C is just uh, M XORed with K. And the decryption operation is just whatever XORed with K, right? So decrypt uh, ciphertext XORed with some edits that we want to make, represented by E. We can instead represent that as K XORed with C XOR E. And since we can move the parens around, we can say that K XOR C XOR E is the same thing. And since the decryption operation is just XOR with K, uh, KXORC is the ciphertext but decrypted, so the plain text message. So this results in the message XORed with our edits. So whatever we XOR into the ciphertext affects the plain text in the exact same way. 
So there we go. We've just proved it. So same thing I was saying previously, just there it is in a proof form. So um, key reuse with stream ciphers is also really, really, really fucking nasty because um, we start with, uh, uh, if you have a plain text uh, ciphertext message pair, like if you have any uh, two mess any, any message where you know both the encrypted and decrypted values, you XOR those together and that gives you the key stream, right? So ciphertext XOR with a message becomes K XOR M XOR M. We flip the parens over. Anything XOR with itself is zero. Anything XOR with zero is itself. So we get the key, right? So if you ever have that key being reused, you have the same you know, uppercase K, you have the same key stream. So you can then derive that key stream from a single ciphertext uh, plain text pair and then decrypt or encrypt anything uh, else, right? Your crypto is completely broken at this point if you reuse keys with stream ciphers. So let's talk about um, one of my favorite attacks, one of the easiest to understand, replay attacks. So basically, uh, you take some encrypted message and use it over again. Um, you already know what the contents are, whether you know exactly the contents or just what the contents mean, what the message is for, what, it's, what it achieves. Um, just reusing this can sometimes work. So imagine that you've got some you know, fancy IoT door lock and it doesn't protect against replay attacks. Uh, so you send it some signal to say, uh, some encrypted signal that says, hey, here's my long complicated passcode, please unlock the door. And I capture that and I replay that well, how, how, like if you're, if you're not making sure that this message is not uh, ever played again, if you're not including some random value, some timestamp, some whatever, then this is gonna work. It doesn't matter if you have unbreakable encryption, unbreakable signing, and a, a long complicated passcode, this will work. Pretty fucking cool, right? So this is like, the math is fine. You, didn't, you don't even know any of the math. It's just the protocol itself is busted. So. You would think that these things don't happen in real life, that like, okay, yes, you've shown me some things that make sense, that I understand, that I could see being really bad, but these don't happen in the real world, I'm sure, because this is too easy. Well, um, ASP.NET had uh, both padding and decryption oracles, which were fixed in 2010. Um, WEP is broken by stream cipher key reuse, and um, you can actually uh, take, uh, you can recognize ARP packets um, un encrypted under WEP by the length and then just resend them and that will always generate a bunch of traffic in response. So you can just do that a whole bunch of time, inject those replayed ARP packets in order to stimulate the network and, and speed up the attack against WEP. Um, Drown relies on key reuse. Uh, NTLM past the hash is basically a replay attack. Um, you can act, you, you, BitLocker and Looks in the past have been too practically malleable and allow for backdooring the encrypted volume, um, which basically means you know you can then get the plain text of the the drive because once it launches you can run any code, so that's as good as anything. Um, I I had a job recent uh, uh, oh sorry not recently I had a job a while ago where um, in a large user community I could just flip an encrypted uh, like. Uh, SSO token basically and get into other people's accounts. Um, that was pretty nasty. They actually had a, a Mac that they generated which is like a, a keyed checksum um, but they weren't actually verifying it. They, 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 they attached the checksum but they didn't actually make sure it was being verified. And then finally um, for a large company that many of you have probably used and definitely know about um, I worked with a bug bounty team, and uh, it's hilarious because you know, uh, the like the a uh, couple days before I showed one of my colleagues this, and then he comes to me and he's like, "Hey Dan, so check this out. They have an encryption oracle. They have a decryption oracle. They're 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 not like integrity checking on their ciphertext, so you can modify it and do this other thing. And they're reusing keys, so like, yes. And this is in a company that you've all heard of, which I wish I could tell you who they are, but just." Just trust me, you know them. So if you think we learn from our mistakes that it's like, okay, well, these are new things and they're gonna be gone in you know, a year, 
so I'll spend all this time learning crypto jazz and then it won't be useful. Well, um, Vaudenay's padding oracle attack that was used to famously break ASP.NET, Java server faces, and uh, what was the third one? Ruby on Rails in 2010 was actually released in the Eurocrypt uh, uh, journal in 2002. So that's eight years. And, you know, like uh, uh, Beast relied on a 2002 paper, and that was in 2011. And then Bleichenbacher's 98 paper on RSA padding oracle attacks is like, you just see that pop up again and again and again. Uh, in, Drown is actually based on Bleichenbacher 98, and that was, you know, in 2016. So that's 18 years that this attack was uh, known, and then it was applied successfully this year. Like, what the fuck? So, here comes Cryptanalib and Feather Duster. So, um, I like to explain it to people as Metasploit, but for crypto, but I feel like a, a dirty startup douche when I do. So, uh, I, I tried to find, I just searched for like startup douche on Google Images, and this guy came up. So, if you, if you know this guy, or if this guy is sitting in the audience, I'm very sorry. Um, but you've got a very punchable face. Um, but so what, what this is, is uh, a, it's a cryptanalysis engine. Cryptanalib and Feather Duster, are, it's a cryptanalysis engine and a framework for building crypto tools. There's a, a large library of attack functions that can be used to build crypto tools. And more than that, f there's Feather Duster, which is like um, a tool built on top of this library that m tries to make it as easy as possible to use as much of the functionality as possible of Cryptanalib. So, why? Why did I do this? Because I have a bone to pick with modern crypto. As you know, it's broken. It's easy to break, and it's broken, and it's been broken for a while with the same old shit. I'm getting tired of it, and the tooling is kind of shitty, right? The, the, the barrier to entry for new crypt analysts seems a lot higher than it is, but there's also just a lack of tooling that's been created. And the tools that do exist are just spread out all over the internet in like single, single Python files or Perl files or Erlang because why not? Um, so this is also um, because crypto, it, it tends to be very such situation specific. You can have encrypted data in as many places as you can have unencrypted data, which is a lot. So, you know, Padbuster, for instance, is a great tool. Uh, it does great things. It's really poorly built and like a, a good chunk of the functionality doesn't actually work and it hasn't been updated in years. So it does great things. Um, but I retract my statement that it's a, it's a great tool. Um, that's maybe a little bit mean, but, um, but I think we can do better than that, right? Um, I want to streamline this kind of work and I make it easier for people who aren't accustomed to doing this kind of work, or at least reduce the amount of effort that people who are used to doing this work have to spend. And I also want to make people's crypto more on fire than it is, because let's face it, like there's a lot of broken crypto out there and it's not receiving that much attention. I want it to receive more attention. So Feather Duster is, so I, I originally just built Cryptanalib, and I was thinking this is the way th that I want to solve this. And then I thought, well, why not add more fuel to the fire and make it even easier to use? So I built Feather Duster on top of it. So it has an analysis engine. Uh, it uses the analysis engine of Cryptanalib to identify lots of things about the uh, samples that you give it. And we'll get into that in a moment. Um, it, it contains a bunch of attack modules for uh, exploiting common flaws. So uh, let's say that you have stream cipher key reuse. It will automate the attack for you of First of all, it will identify that, hey, this, this looks like a stream cipher, and it also kind of looks like they're reusing keys. Do you want to run this thing? So you can and break it. Awesome. Um, if you have enough samples, it can actually even break it without having any known plain text whatsoever. So that's fun. Um, and I'd love to explain that to you if I have time. I don't know if I do, so we'll, we'll keep that in our back pocket for now. Uh, there's also a crypto autopone, which is great. Um, but yeah, Cryptanalib is sort of the moving parts behind it. It's, it does the heavy lifting for Feather Duster. And uh, there's a lot of functionality in Cryptanalib that you can write tools, you know, but there wasn't, I either have been too lazy to write a Feather module for it so far, or it's just not the kind of thing that you can easily generalize with uh, an easy to run menu driven module. So, um, so 
let's take a look at the analysis engine. Um, here it is. We're running this uh, engine against a, a uh, folder full of RSA keys. Um, and it's able to correctly identify that yes, there are RSA keys in amongst these files, and there's even uh, some private key components uh, that were found. Um, so if we just make up our own algorithm and uh, feed it to Cryptanalib, it's like, yep, this kind of looks like garbage. So um, this is mostly based on uh, randomness. Uh, obviously, if you can't distinct, um, so one of the properties of really strong crypto is that it's indistinguishable from random. So if you give me a piece, a piece of truly random data, like you know you measure the output of radioactive decay, and then you just translate that into bits, and then give an equal amount of those bits to me, and you know to to, to match the length of some actual ciphertext from a strong algorithm, I should not be able to guess which is which any more than 50% of the time reliably. So um, basically looking at the properties of the samples and seeing like how random is this, how, what, like, what's the byte distribution and whatnot, there are some things that should be uh, a certain way and if for the frequencies of the bytes or something like that are too far off we can easily say well this is not strong crypto because we can distinguish this as l not looking very random at all. Now obviously this is, this is um, prone to false positives and false negatives because we can never truly be sure from a black box perspective, but it's very reliable in practice. Um, it can also identify some, some small problems like uh, ECB. I guess that's a big problem in some cases. Um, but here we are feeding it uh, ECB. So it says, hey, you know, um, this is, a, it correctly identifies it as a block cipher with a, a block size of 16 and says, hey, this is ECB mode, there's problems with this. So using feather dusters, <coughs> using feather duster is pretty simple. Um, it's a pretty simple workflow. You just import the samples, uh, choose how to narrow the attack module list to what might work. And so you can either choose, hey, uh, tell me what modules you think would work, or just run the modules you think would work, or let me search for a keyword and you can tell me if you have any modules that match that, or you can just spit out the entire list of modules and look through them yourself. And then you run the attacks. Um, the modules are responsible for asking for additional information if more is needed, and then it will maybe break your crypto and maybe it won't. So. Um, Using Cryptanalib is as simple as importing the module, uh, the, the, the Cryptanalib library. Um, you can drop this in your site packages directory so that you can just import Cryptanalib uh, from whatever script you want, uh, or you can just be in the directory with cryptanalib.py when you launch Python or a, some Python script and it will, you'll be able to import Cryptanalib. So um, you can, uh, these are all, uh, well-documented functions, so if you just run pydoc uh, cryptanalib or if you uh, go into the Python command line and run dir and help, you'll be able to get help for each of the functions and understand what they do. And this is still kind of a work in progress because it's still beta software, but um, here's an example of one of the functions that you, you, um, you kind of have to write your own module around because it's a, a thing that's hard to apply in a generic sense is uh, padding oracle attacks, Vodnay's padding oracle attack. This is a sort of a cryptographic MVP here. Um, so um, I, on, a, on like a full bottle of red wine's worth of intoxication, um, I wrote this uh, Hollywood style visualization for the uh, padding oracle. So basically what this is doing here, um, this script, this test script, um, takes a, it generates a random AES key from just random bytes from URandom and a random IV and uh, encrypts whatever message you give it and then provides a padding oracle. And so it, it uh, takes the ciphertext version of this, uh, this data and uh, modifies it in such a way that it can learn byte by byte what the plain text message is just by knowing whether the padding for any given message is good or bad. Um, so this, uh, you know, this will go about its way for a while, but it actually is, um, I'm not just, you know, showing you a bite at a time because 
you know, it looks fun and more hackery. This is actually the case where you do learn a byte at a time what the actual message is. So this is real-time updates on what the algorithm has learned. Um, so there you go. We've successfully decrypted a message using padding oracle attack. Um, so basically all you need to do to write this is to, with a real padding oracle, is to write a little Python function that goes out and queries that oracle with a given piece of cipher text, with, with a given uh, uh, piece of cipher text, and then will return true or false based on whether the padding is good or bad. That's all you need to do, and then you pass that function that you've written to Cryptanalib's padding oracle function, and it will do all the rest of the work. So pretty cool. Now, feather modules are sort of the, uh, the attack modules that are available through Feather Duster. There's not a whole huge amount of them right now, but I expect them to grow, and I'm trying to get community help with this, because if I just write all the modules, it's, it'll still be cool, but if I can get everybody to write modules, and you can even just take like some, some existing tool and write a third-party module for it that just calls out to this tool. So like, for instance, um, hash extender you could call out to external tools like Hash Extender or John the Ripper or something like that so that when, um, when Feather Duster says, hey, these are all SHA-256 hashes, you know, uh, then all of a sudden the John the Ripper module comes up and you can ship them off to John the Ripper. Or if you wanted to write your own hash cracker, it's probably not going to work as well as John the Ripper, but you could, right? So Feather modules need a very small amount of data uh, that distinguishes them from just ordinary Python scripts. You need an attack name, an attack description. Uh, you need keywords for attack suggestions so that when the analysis engine uh, tries to recommend the relevant modules, yours will actually come up. Um, and then you need an attack function that's uh, referred to in the, the sort of metadata. So as long as you've done all those things, you've got a, fa uh, you've got a valid feather module and you're your script can do really whatever. And if you want to install a custom Feather module, like a third-party module, or you've just built one and you don't want to have to edit the code so it's recognized, <coughs> you can drop it in the custom directory. Um, if there are any third-party dependencies, obviously you're going to need those. Um, but just copy that into Feather module slash custom, and Feather Duster will, read it, will uh, recognize it on the next time it's run. So. Um, I want to show you sort of the power of Feather Duster. Um, so I did a demo video that I'm going to play for you now where I beat challenges one through three on a recent CTF called uh, Hakim CTF. So and I'll, I'll describe the attacks a little bit so you're not just like watching me type for like three minutes. Um, so we import Cryptanalib um, and alias it to CA to make that easier. So the first challenge um, is a challenge where you have uh, multi-byte XOR encrypted data. And you have the plain text for one of the files, and then you have another uh, piece of cipher, another cipher text sample that doesn't have a corresponding plain text. And that's the one that you need to crack, right? So for any XOR-based whatever, if you're using the same key, you XOR the uh, cipher text and the plain text together, as we discussed earlier. Uh, and you, that, that pulls out the key stream. And then you can just XOR that with any, encrypt, uh, any other encrypted message and get the plain text out of it. So that's exactly what we do here. We open up um, the uh, encrypted and unencrypted versions of the heart message and then XOR them together and then XOR that resulting value with the mindcrypt uh, file here. And that gives, us, um, that gives us a URL which when we visit that, gives us the flag. So here we are, we just nest the called uh, string XOR, SXOR, uh, out of Cryptanalib, and we get this URL, we go to that, and it turns out the title of the URL, oddly enough, is the flag. So challenge one is done. Um, so next, the next challenge, there is a, an alphabetic shift. Um, so this is actually a way easier challenge than Crypto 1, but whatever. So we, um, we pull in the uh, ciphertext and then um, asks if, if, if we want to add additional samples. No, we say, uh, we, we already can tell this is an alphabetic shift, but we analyze it, see what it comes up with. Right now there's a bug in Feather Duster where it, it doesn't 
I haven't found a good way to identify alphabetic shifts without having like huge false positive rates. So I just say, show me everything. So I run alpha shift. It tries an alphabetic shift with every possible key of which there are 26. We get the right one pretty quickly. Um, one of the things that's built into cryptanalib is a plain text detection function. So um, it, ba it bases its uh, plain text detection on a couple different things. You have uh, character frequency. So how often does E appear? You know, you've probably used this to solve some cryptogram here or there, just little puzzles. Um, but also you have digraphs. So how much do, how often do two characters appear one after another? So particular character sequences. Um, we also have uh, word detection. So you have common words in English like the, and, be, to, is. Um, if those things show up in the ciphertext, that's a pretty good indication that we've had a successful decryption. So we look for those as well in, in certain cases where that's actually relevant. So um, this is a little bit boring watching this go, so I've cut out a little bit of uh, the video, and I think I'm actually going to cut to the end of the video just because uh, you kind of get what's going on here. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, you can. Um, I don't think you can do so through Feather Duster just yet, but if you use, if you call it out of Cryptanalib, you can specify your own cribs. Um, there's functionality for creating your own frequency table. So let's say that you uh, want to decrypt some firmware that you know is uh, encrypted with multibyte XOR. You can take a bunch of firmware images that are unencrypted and analyze them, preferably for the same architecture, and say, what's the you know, expected byte frequencies for this? What's the expected you know, digraphs, et cetera? Generate that frequency table, and then a list of cribs that you, know, you might have like ELF headers and stuff like that in there. So you can make those cribs, pass those to the plain text, uh, pass those to the multibyte XOR as the usable frequency table and uh, cribs and it will use those in its analysis to figure out what the successful decryption was. So, um, so there's that. Um, this video was in initially uh, six minutes, but I cut it down, so. So Feather Duster is pretty effective. Um, I went up to something like 19th place in an hour um, with just Feather Duster, so that was pretty cool. I only have a couple minutes left, um, so if you want to learn more, um, I can recommend the Coursera course Cryptography 1 with Dan Bona. It's a really good, uh, pretty gentle introduction. The, uh, the math is a little bit uh, annoying. It's not tough, it's just expressed in a very academic way, so it's kind of tough to slog through, but if you kind of skip over the first few, you can kind of get it. There's also the CryptoPals exercises, a bunch of practical crypto exploitation challenges. Uh, there's CryptoMG, which is made by, a good, I, 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 I did a little bit of work on it, but it's mostly the, uh, the work of a good friend of mine named Andrew, Andrew Jordan. And uh, I can also recommend Slove to you. So, uh, so the question is, what is Slove? Uh, the answer is, baby, don't hurt me, don't hurt me, no more. Um, so, um, by attending this talk, you are now in the closed beta, so you get a copy of Feather Duster, and you get a copy of Feather Duster, and you get a copy of Feather Duster. Look under your seat. Uh, there's, uh, there, if somebody's like left a soda canner there, please clean it up, you know, we want to minimize the impact on the hotel staff. But you get bees, I mean Feather Duster. So, uh, if you go to tinyurl.com slash whatisslove, um, or uh, that, that points to uh, lolwhatcon.com slash beta underscore feather dust. I'm sorry about the underscores not showing up in these links very well. But um, if, if you just go to preview.tinyurl.com slash whatisslove, uh, it will show you the URL it's going to redirect you to, and you can choose whether or not you want to redirect if you don't trust me, which, why should you? So, uh, yeah, if you want feather duster, um, what is slove? Um, so uh, NCC Group has a lot of office locations. Austin is one of them. Um, and that's where I work from. And I'm Daniel Crowley. I'm a senior security consultant with NCC Group. And here's my email if you have any questions. I also have one minute left where I can take questions. And I'm going to go back to the uh, link slide. So if you didn't get that and you want a copy of Feather Duster, you can get it. So I have now 50 seconds for questions. So questions, anybody? 
Oh, it does. The crypto class starts Monday. Cool. So uh, just, just to, to clarify, you don't actually need to do the course when it's running. All the lectures are uh, recorded in video form, so you can watch them at your leisure or leisurier if you pronounce things incorrectly. Um, so yeah, it's, it's nice. And all the homework is available, all that sort of thing. Any other questions? So I'm also a member of AHA. If you live in Austin and you don't go to AHA, um, you probably should because it's awesome. Um, I think I might have time to squeeze in one last question. Anything? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me no more. OK, so I've now officially reached uh, zero seconds left. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Again, um, if you want to reach me by email for further questions, this is my email address. Thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy playing with Feather Duster as much as I enjoyed making it. <laughs>